In this video, we're going to start a new topic on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy, which is GraphQL API attacks. And there's quite a lot of background information for this one, just on like what GraphQL is and how we can work with it in Burp Suite. And I want to cover that in an introductory video before we actually start the labs. So basically, we're not going to be looking at any of the practical labs in this video. I'm just going to be reading through the information that's on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy. So if you'd rather do that in your own time or you've already read through it, you can just skip to the next video where we'll start on the first lab. GraphQL vulnerabilities generally arise due to implementation and design flaws. For example, the introspection feature may be left active, enabling attackers to query the API in order to glean information about its schema. GraphQL attacks usually take the form of malicious requests that can enable an attacker to obtain data or perform unauthorized actions. These attacks can have a severe impact, especially if the user is able to gain admin privileges by manipulating queries or executing a CSRF exploit. Vulnerable GraphQL APIs can also lead to information disclosure issues. So we have two additional links here, one on what is GraphQL and then one on working with GraphQL in Burp Suite. So let's take a look at the first one. GraphQL is an API query language that's designed to facilitate efficient communication between clients and servers. It enables the user to specify exactly what data they want in response, helping to avoid large response objects and multiple calls that can sometimes be seen with REST APIs. GraphQL services define a contract through which a client can communicate with the server. The client doesn't need to know where the data resides. Instead, clients send queries to a GraphQL server, which fetches data from the relevant places. As GraphQL is platform agnostic, it can be implemented with a wide range of programming languages and can be used to communicate with virtually any data store. GraphQL schemas define the structure of a service's data, listing the available objects known as types, fields, and relationships. The data described by a GraphQL schema can be manipulated using three types of operations. Queries, which fetch data. Mutations, which add, change, or remove data. Subscriptions, which are similar to queries, but set up a permanent connection by which a server can proactively push data to a client in a specified format. All GraphQL operations use the same endpoint, which are generally sent as a post request. This is significantly different to REST APIs, which use operation-specific endpoints across a range of HTTP methods. With GraphQL, the type and name of the operation define how the query is handled, rather than the endpoint it is sent to or the HTTP method that's used. GraphQL services generally respond to operations with a JSON object in the structured request. In GraphQL, the schema represents a contract between the front end and back end of the service. It defines the data available as a series of types using a human readable schema definition language. These types can be then implemented by a service. Most of the types defined are object types, which define the objects available and the fields and arguments they have. Each field has its own type, which can either be another object or a scalar, enum, union, interface, or custom type. The example below shows a simple schema definition for a product type. The exclamation mark operator indicates that the field is non-nullable when called, therefore it's mandatory. Schemas must also include at least one available query. Usually, they also contain the details of available mutations. GraphQL queries retrieve data from the data store. They are roughly equivalent to GET requests in a REST API. Queries usually have the following key components. A query operation type, this is technically optional but encouraged as it explicitly tells the server that the incoming request is a query. You also want a query name. This can be anything you want and it is also optional but encouraged as it can help with debugging. A data structure. This is the data that the query should return. And then optionally, one or more arguments. These are used to create queries that return details of a specific object. So for example, give me the name and description of a product that has the ID 123. The example below shows a query called my get product query that requests the name and the description fields of a product with the ID 123. Note that the product type may contain more fields in the schema than those requested here. The ability to request only the data you need is a significant part of the flexibility of GraphQL. Mutations change data in some way, either adding, deleting, or editing it. They're roughly equivalent to a REST API's post, put, and delete methods. Like queries, mutations have an operation type, name, and structure for the return data. However, mutations always take an input of some type. This can be an inline value, but in practice is generally provided as a variable. The example below shows a mutation to create a new product and its associated response. In this case, the service is configured to automatically assign an ID to new products, which has been returned as requested. 
So here's the example of our mutation request. We've got a create product and it takes the name flaming cocktail glasses listed is set to yes. And then it's going to return the ID, the name and listed. And then you can see the response. It has created a product. It's given it the ID one, two, three, and then it has returned the name and the listed value as well. The GraphQL syntax includes several common components for queries and mutations. The first is fields and all GraphQL types contain items of queryable data called fields. When you send a query or a mutation, you specify which of the fields you want the API to return. The response mirrors the content specified in the request. The example below shows a query to get the ID and name details for all employees and its associated response. In this case, the ID, the name.firstName and the name.lastName are the fields requested. Arguments are values that are provided for specific fields. The arguments that can be accepted for a type are defined in the schema. When you send a query or a mutation that contains arguments, the GraphQL server determines how to respond based on its configuration. For example, it might return a specific object rather than the details of all objects. The example below shows a get employee request that takes an employee ID as an argument. And in this case, the server responds with only the details of the employee who matches that ID. Variables enable you to pass dynamic arguments rather than having arguments directly within the query itself. Variable-based queries use the same structure as queries using inline arguments, but certain aspects of the query are taken from a separate JSON-based variables dictionary. They enable you to reuse a common structure among multiple queries with the only value of the variable itself changing. When building a query or mutation that uses variables, you need to declare the variable in the type, add the variable name in the appropriate place in the query, pass the variable key and value from the variable dictionary. The example below shows the same query as in the previous example, but with the ID passed as a variable instead of as a direct part of the query string. In this example, the variable is declared in the first line. The exclamation mark indicates that it's a required field for this query. It's then used as an argument in the second line. And finally, the value of the variable itself is set in the variable JSON dictionary. GraphQL objects can't contain multiple properties with the same name. For example, the following query is invalid because it tries to return the product type twice. Aliases enable you to bypass this restriction by explicitly naming the properties you want the API to return. You can use aliases to return multiple instances of the same type of object in one request. This helps to reduce the number of API calls needed. In the example below, the query uses aliases to specify a unique name for both products. This query now passes validation and the details are returned. Note, using aliases with mutations effectively enables you to send multiple GraphQL messages in one HTTP request. We'll see how we can use this later to bypass rate limits in the practical labs. Fragments are reusable parts of queries or mutations. They contain a subset of fields belonging to the associated type. Once defined, they can be included in queries or mutations. If they're subsequently changed, the change is included in every query or mutation that calls the fragment. The example below shows a get product query in which the details of the product are contained in a product info fragment. Subscriptions are a special type of query. They enable clients to establish a long-lived connection with a server so that the server can then push real-time updates to the client without the need to continually poll for data. They are primarily useful for small changes to large objects and for functionality that requires small real-time updates like chat systems or collaborative editing. As with regular queries and mutations, the subscription request defines the shape of the data to be returned. Subscriptions are commonly implemented using WebSockets. Introspection is a built-in GraphQL function that enables you to query a server for information about the schema. It's commonly used by applications such as GraphQL, IDEs, and documentation generation tools. Like regular queries, you can specify the fields and structure of your response that you want to be returned. For example, you might want the response to only contain names of available mutations. Introspection can represent a serious information disclosure risk as it can be used to access potentially sensitive information such as the field descriptions and help an attacker learn how they can interact with the API. It's best practice for introspection to be disabled in production environments. So now that we know what GraphQL is, let's find out how we can work with it in Burp Suite. A bit of a recap here. GraphQL is an API query language that's designed to facilitate efficient communication between clients and servers. It enables the user to specify exactly what data they want in the response. 
helping to avoid large response objects and multiple calls that can sometimes be seen with REST APIs. GraphQL services are commonly used in authentication and data retrieval mechanisms, and this means that if an attacker can successfully send a malicious request, they may be able to access vulnerable information or even execute high severity exploits such as cross-site request forgery. If Burp detects a GraphQL request, it automatically adds a GraphQL tab to the message editor for that request. This tab separates the GraphQL query from the rest of the request and formats it in a way that makes it easy to view and edit the query structure and its associated variables. Introspection queries can return information about a GraphQL schema, such as the queries and mutations that are supported by the API. This information is extremely useful when planning how to attack an API. Burp can generate introspection queries for you to send to your target application. The data returned in the response can be used to identify how to test the target's application GraphQL API for vulnerabilities. To run introspection, we should browse the target application looking for requests to a GraphQL endpoint, and those services often have a similar endpoint, so slash GraphQL, slash API, things like that. And it may also include a version number such as slash v1 at the end. We then right-click the GraphQL request and send it to the repeater. And then once we get to the repeater, we can right-click and we'll have a new GraphQL option which has a set introspection query in it. And that'll allow us to get back the full information about the schema. This introspection query works with most GraphQL servers. However, if you're working with an older server, it might fail. And if that happens, you can right-click anywhere in the request and select set legacy introspection query instead of set introspection query. Once the response comes back, we can right click in the response panel and select the GraphQL menu again and use the save GraphQL queries to sitemap. Each of the available queries that Burp discovered will be saved as a node on the sitemap and then we can examine them further. So now that we know what GraphQL is and how we can work with it in Burp Suite, let's learn a little bit about how we can enumerate GraphQL endpoints and formulate some of our attack plans. Before you can test the GraphQL API, you first need to find its endpoint. As GraphQL APIs use the same endpoint for all requests, this is a valuable piece of information. If you send the following query type name command to any GraphQL endpoint, it will include the string data type name query somewhere in its response. This is known as a universal query, and it's a useful tool in probing whether a URL corresponds to a GraphQL service. The query works because every GraphQL endpoint has a reserved field called type name that returns the queried object's type as a string. Some common endpoint names that we can look for are GraphQL, API, API GraphQL, GraphQL API, and GraphQL GraphQL. And if none of those work, we can append a slash v1 to the end of it, see if we get anything back. Note that GraphQL services often respond to any non-GraphQL requests with a query not present or similar error. So you should bear this in mind when testing for GraphQL endpoints. The next step in trying to find GraphQL endpoints is to test using different request methods. It's best practice for production GraphQL endpoints to only accept post requests that have a content type of application slash JSON, as this helps protect against CSRF vulnerabilities. However, some endpoints may accept alternative methods such as get requests or post requests that use a content type of xww-form-url encoded. If you can't find a GraphQL endpoint by sending post requests to common endpoints, you can try and resend the universal query using alternative HTTP methods. And once you've found the endpoint, you can send some test requests to understand a little more about how it works. If the endpoint is powering a website, try and explore the web interface in Burp's browser and use the HTTP history to examine the requests that are sent. At this point, you can start to look for vulnerabilities. Testing query arguments is a good place to start. If the API uses arguments to access objects directly, it may be vulnerable to access control vulnerabilities. A user could potentially access information they should not have access to by supplying an argument that corresponds to that information. This is sometimes known as an insecure direct object reference or IDOR. For example, the query below requests a product list for an online shop. The product list returned contains only listed products. From this, we can infer the following. Products are assigned a sequential ID and product ID 3 is missing from the list, possibly because it's been delisted. By querying the ID of the missing product, we can get its details even though it's not listed on the shop and was not returned by the original product query. The next step in testing the API is to piece together information about the underlying schema. The best way to do this is to use introspection queries. 
Introspection is a built-in GraphQL function that enables you to query a server for information about the schema. Introspection helps you to understand how you can interact with the GraphQL API, and it can also disclose potentially sensitive information such as description fields. To use introspection to discover schema information, we can query the schema field, and this field is available on the root type of all queries. Like regular queries, you can specify the fields and structure of the response you want to be returned when running an introspection query. For example, you may want the response to contain only the names of available mutations. It's best practice for introspection to be disabled in production environments, but this advice is not always followed. You can probe for introspection using the following simple query. If introspection is enabled, the response returns the name of all available queries. The Burp scanner can automatically test for introspection during its scans, so if it finds that introspection is enabled, it will report that as an issue. The next step is to run a full introspection query against the endpoints so that you can get as much information about the underlying schema as possible. The example query below returns full details on all queries, mutations, subscriptions, types, and fragments. Note, if introspection is enabled but the above query doesn't run, we can try removing the on operation, on fragment, and on field directives from the query structure. Many endpoints do not accept these directives as part of an introspection query, and you can often have more success with introspection by removing them. Responses to introspection queries can be full of information, but are often very long and hard to process. You can view relationships between schema entities more easily using the GraphQL visualizer. This is an online tool that takes the results of an introspection query and produces a visual representation of the return data, including the relationships between operations and types. Even if introspection is entirely disabled, you can sometimes use suggestions to glean information on an API structure. Suggestions are a feature of the Apollo GraphQL platform in which the server can suggest query amendments and error messages. These are generally used when a query is slightly incorrect but recognizable. So for example, it might return saying there is no entry for product info, did you mean product information instead? You can potentially glean useful information from this as the response is effectively given away valid parts of its schema. Clairvoyance is a tool that uses suggestions to automatically recover all or part of a GraphQL schema, even when the introspection is disabled. This makes it significantly less time consuming to piece together information from suggestion responses. You cannot disable suggestions directly in Apollo, but you can see this GitHub thread for a workaround. And that's it, we're done with all the theory. Now we'll be able to jump straight into these two practical labs in the next two videos. So I hope you understand why I did this in this video, mainly because there is no separation of the background information for these two labs. So if I save this stuff for the first lab video, then all of the information will be missing from the second lab video. And I thought it would just be easier just to put all of the theory into the first video because I'm sure there's a lot of people who would rather just get straight into the practical labs or have already read through all of this information or just don't want to listen to me read it out, which is completely understandable. So that being said, although I won't go back through this text in the future videos, I will try to recap some parts of it just in case people miss this video or got some of the information. So if we try a certain technique, maybe I'll just flick back to a screenshot of this information in Port Swigger. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. As usual, let me just recommend that you sign up to the Integrity platform if you want to try and find some GraphQL vulnerabilities and get paid for it. This is a good place to start. And any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.